Good morning. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the Middle East Institute's panel on Preventing Violence in the Name of God, Religion and Diplomacy in the Middle East. And I would like to uh, issue a special welcome to our C-SPAN viewers this morning. This is the second in MEI series on diplomacy and religion. The first we held a month ago of featuring Cardinal McCarrick and Ayatollah Erevani taking up the topic from a religious point of view. And today we take it up from a diplomatic perspective. Things have changed regarding religion and statecraft in US diplomacy and particularly in the Department of State. Madeleine Albright records in her memoirs, The Mighty and the Almighty, many practitioners of foreign policy, including me, have sought to separate religion from world politics, to liberate logic from beliefs that transcend logic. This attitude contrasts sharply with Secretary Kerry at the launch of the State Department's Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. He admonished, we ignore the global impact of religion at our peril, and told foreign service officers, go out and engage religious leaders and faith-based faith -based communities in our day-to-day -day work. At a time when religious violence inflames the Middle East, the question of how diplomacy and religion can interact takes on a high operational importance. What is the Department of State doing to fulfill Secretary Kerry's instructions? What are the scope and the limits of cooperation? We are honored this morning uh, to welcome our panelists. First of all, Jerry White to my right. Jerry is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, in the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. And uh, I have to say, a leader in uh, landmine, uh, what do you call it, removal. <laughs> uh, an unconventional diplomat. Also, Arsalan Soleiman, the Deputy U.S. Envoy to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and it's a tribute uh, to uh, his commitment to, uh, that he is taking time off from paternity leave after being a father for now one week. So, <laughs> I'd also like to... Uh, I'd also like to welcome Ambassador Tom Pickering, whose very distinguished diplomatic career includes ambassadorships on almost every continent, except, I believe, Antarctica, uh, as well as being under, under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Jerry will speak first and give the general outlines. Arsalan will speak next and fill in about the OIC. Ambassador Pickering will provide commentary at the end. So, Jerry, the floor is yours. And it might be better if you speak up here so everybody okay. can hear you. Great. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Ellen, for the kind introduction. Um, it's actually a very exciting time to be at the State Department working particularly on this issue of the nexus of diplomacy and religion as well as conflict. As you heard, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, the newest Bureau at the State Department of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. And it was launched under Secretary Clinton as a new bureau to develop, as you heard, non-traditional ways of engaging on issues of conflict prevention, mitigation, and also crisis response. So as we see around the world, there's, there's plenty to do. The question is how to pick um, which battles and how to proceed. It turns out that one of them that I think was prescient for Secretary Clinton and now Secretary Kerry was the issue of religion and diplomacy. And I would say that this year, 2014 to 2015, may become known as the year of religion and conflict and diplomacy because it is front and center on every newspaper. Um, as you're reading it, people are confused of what is religious violence? Is there such a thing? What's really the source of the underlying conditions for violence? When is religion serving more as kerosene or a match lighting and accelerating or, or causing a viral spread of violence? What are we seeing happening in the Middle East, for example? Is this something new or old? 
So when I first came into the State Department nearly three years ago, um, this was starting to percolate. Secretary Clinton had started a strategic dialogue on religion and diplomacy. And I was charged with um, chairing a working group on religion and conflict mitigation. Actually, when I first came in, quite frankly, someone gave me a bucket of, of books and papers and says, Jerry, you love this stuff. Why don't you take it over? And I thought it was interesting. There was sort of a cultural bias against taking on religion, as you heard from the quote from Secretary Albright's book. It was the third rail you weren't supposed to touch. So there we were with a basket and lots of ideas, but people understanding we had to tackle this new issue. So the issue was um, a bias, uh, I think, in terms of culture. Because of our establishment clause, as you understand, and the perception of separation of church and state and the reality of what that would mean, most people just wouldn't touch religious engagement. It just was one of those things, don't do it, we aren't allowed, or go to the legal office at State Department, in a sense, get permission to engage. So this was a challenge for, for world diplomacy when you find out that actually 85% of the world are religious or function out of sets of beliefs and rituals and practices. So not even knowing that language, not being able to engage at that most fundamental level is a challenge. So the question was, how does one really understand the separation of church and state and the establishment clause as it applies to our role in diplomacy and representing the US government abroad? So religious engagement has become the new hot topic, it turns out. The second piece that was a challenge was finding out that after 9-11, the concept of how to engage became a little, perhaps, instrumental. You know, after 9-11, how do we engage with you know, Muslims who hate us or like us? Or a vocabulary of terrorism and extremism um, was attached to and muddled the religious dialogue. So the concept was more utilitarian. There are good partners and bad partners, and somehow we were in the business of judging who on the scale was moderate or extreme, or who we could actually engage with. This was another challenge to overcome, or an obstacle to, I think, healthy dialogue that we had been wrestling with as well. And the third was basically just the capacity. Um, we found that, in fact, the Foreign Service Institute had not actually had lots of training of our diplomats in faith-based engagement or in religious sensitivities. I think there was an optional class of four days maximum or maybe four hours en route to Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever you were going to be stationed next. So looking at that dearth of training materials was a challenge because, in fact, there wasn't religious literacy inside the U.S. government and among our diplomatic class for the most part as well as um, just this idea of what where do you call, where do you go to in the State Department? It turns out there were different people working on pieces of this. So Secretary Kerry came in and actually moved very quickly to launch the first sort of faith-based community initiatives office and assigned a special advisor, a senior advisor, Sean Casey, to help navigate this space. Because up until this point, there was another issue in terms of who to call. People went to the Religious Freedom Office, and that's one of the very important strands of our engagement policy and, and what we do at the State Department. But it's not the only thing. So what has happened is the White House and the State Department have done a complete, I would say, U-turn or 180 degree shift in the last year in terms of religious engagement. And they set up you know, three major lines of effort um, and three working groups to accompany them. Number one is how to partner with religious communities around the world and in the United States on issues related to health, development, and humanitarian assistance. That's one big strand. The second is, as I just mentioned, religious freedom, human rights and pluralism. How is it the protection of minorities and religious groups um, is in the category of religious freedom that we have been standing for you know, since our founding. And third was the working group that I co-chair related to conflict mitigation. So that's um, where we stand. There's been a change. There have been new case studies coming forward. And we set out to look at new training materials that are now being finished up after a year of, of work that I think um, may not be perfect, but may be among the best that are out there in terms of diplomatic training on these particular issues of biases, stereotypes, establishment clause, but also how to navigate religion in conflict zones. 
So one thing to keep in mind, and perhaps we could discuss, is how is it that a religion or religious language can manifest itself in conflict? And therefore, how do you engage with different groups who might be in a different phase of their religious formation? Or, for example, if a group feels under existential threat, the language they use that may be more exclusivist or fear-based, black and white, could shift sometimes to a call to violence. But is it going to be violent? Is hate speech, no matter how despicable, going to trigger violence? We're now just learning at how to look at language usage in ways that could show or indicate that violent behavior could be coming. It doesn't mean that someone expressing themselves on social media or um, elsewhere in hateful ways are going to be violent. So our job at the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations is to look at that space of violence, not necessarily the space of free speech and religion, but it's important to, to track language. Other language on the other end of the spectrum might be as they call normative or textbook language. You might be an Episcopal priest or you might be um, a faith-based organization like World Vision, and you may use faith-based motivated language but in fact, you function just like an NGO, almost along secular and humanitarian principles, but your values based and your belief underpins that work. How to engage on that end of the spectrum is another um, uh, way to look at things, another, another approach that in fact is, is sort of what most embassies would be used to working with, Catholic relief services, uh, Islamic relief, and others. So, and there's everything in between. After a war, for example, in a conflict zone, religious groups may be in a period of questioning or recovery or wondering how to find their way um, and navigate the reconstruction of their country and of their communities after violence. So that's another space of engagement which is more, one might say, um, almost like trauma recovery after war. How is it that your humanitarian work, your community-based outreach can minister to your communities in ways that are open and ripe for a partnership and with the United States, with other governments and other partners uh, locally? So all of this just gives you a flavor of what has been happening at the State Department in terms of, of policy. Um, what is actually the intention on the ground to work on these three main issues and working groups. And I think actually, um, lastly, I would, I would say that w the working group that we're use working on right now is looking at the possibility of a global covenant using sort of some religiously infused language because um, the Prince of Jordan and the King of Jordan have asked for a response from the United Nations, but also world religious leaders, including the Pope, Archbishop of Canterbury and others, to take a look at how do we respond to the type of violence that we're seeing that seems that it's politically and religiously infused? You know, what is it about this language and what can we do to protect belief, protect practices, and also protect sort of groups and even sacred sites, for example, that are trigger points and flashpoints for violence? So I would say the Global Covenant Initiative is um, being looked at by the working group because it's not generated or started by the United States, but we would like to track it and understand how to work and lead from alongside our colleagues around the world in the Middle East and elsewhere on looking at this new challenge of religiously motivated or related violence. So there are three, I'll, I'll close with the three pieces of this. One is just the interreligious leadership. What is it where iconic or, or religious elders can gather together, almost like Pope John Paul did in Assisi, pulling people together, religious leaders from around the world, to renounce this collective violence in the name of God or mass killing in the name of religion? That is something that non-state actors and leaders have to address, even outside the nation-state parameters um, of the UN, for example. So one movement is at that highest level of religious groups talking to each other and developing some declaration. The second level is, as I mentioned, the UN level. Nation states have laws and policies against genocide, violence, and other norms. But something different seems to be entering in, which is violence against religions themselves. Not just individuals or human rights violations, but groups and their practices and their beliefs um, and their gatherings their cemeteries, their sacred sites. So the UN would like to look at the ISIL question as, a, as illustrative, but also Boko Haram, wherever we're seeing extreme violence being conducted in the name of religion, what can be preventative to, to stop that and inhibit that or contain it, 
but also when is it actually a crime against humanity. These are new international issues that are coming up that are not just nation to nation, but also dealing with non-state actors who are committing atrocities. And lastly, NGOs around the world have been on the front lines doing this work for some time, and they have many best practices, you know, countering violent extremism, as well as promoting resilience and, and religion with its positive role. Um, people know a lot about that, and violence takes place at a communal level. So this third level is intercommunally, what are the best practices, how do people build neighborhood to neighborhood, the type of resilient fabric that prevents and protects against future violence, um, whether reconstructing after war or just uh, to prevent future conflict between religious and other communities. So that's a lot, but it is to say that in the last couple of years, and quite, as, as Alan mentioned, quite a significant shift in how the United States government and our allies are looking at this issue and based on lessons we've learned from the past. So thank you for your attention and interest in the topic. Uh, thank you. I'd like to also thank the Middle East Institute, uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for organizing and hosting this panel and also for Alan and for, for Jerry and Ambassador Pickering for uh, being here on the panel with me today. Um, Jerry gave a, a much of the overview of a lot of the changes at the department and I just wanted to add one small thing to that which, what, which is um, to highlight the role that the White House strategy on religious leader engagement played. Um, in 2013, the White House issued this strategy, which uh, is meant to um, you know, promote government-wide greater engagement with religious leaders in the three areas that Jerry outlined. Um, so it's not just the State Department, but it's also meant to affect uh, you know, our Department of Defense, USAID, and other actors who are engaging in foreign policy work and diplomatic work uh, in order to encourage them to also um, engage with these communities who are playing, as Jerry mentioned, you know, a, a very significant role in the world. And uh, if we ignore them, we ignore them to our peril. Um, I, I want to spend my time uh, in my remarks just talking a little bit about some of the work that we've done out of the um, Office of the Special Envoy to the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as a little bit of an example of some of the ways that we have engaged uh, and, co and worked in collaboration with religious actors in order to promote some of the goals, um, including some of the goals that, that Jerry talked about. Um, so. Some of you may not be familiar, but the Office of the Special Envoy to the OIC was established at the end of the George W. Bush administration. And President Obama uh, appointed Special Envoy Rashad Hussein to the position. And when he did so, he gave him the mandate of deepening and expanding the partnerships that the President announced uh, during his Cairo speech. And as you probably remember, the Cairo speech went through a whole litany of issues. Um, sort of the hot topic issues that have been problematic in terms of U.S. relations with the Muslim world in general. And so these cover things from um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to counterterrorism policies to human rights issues to democracy promotion, all of these issues. And so our office um, you know, has worked on a lot of different areas, but one of the areas that we have been working on in particular is to engage with religious uh, communities and religious leaders in our work in order to include them uh, because of the significant role that they play uh, in general and also in particular in, in, in Muslim societies. Um, so one example that I want to give, which touches a little bit on what Jerry was talking about in terms of the role of, of the UN um, and how um, religious communities uh, sometimes define themselves as a group uh, is an initiative that we worked on that dealt with the issue of defamation of religions. Uh, some of you may be familiar, but beginning in 1998, the OIC had advocated a resolution at the UN on the so-called defamation of religions. It was a resolution that uh, essentially was calling out a lot of the um, hate speech or discrimination um, or Islamophobia that uh, many people were identifying in the post 9-11 years in particular, but even before that, because this, this, this resolution started in 1998, before uh, even 9-11. 
Um, and the idea behind it, in part, was to address uh, discrimination against people on the basis of religion. However, the problem that the United States had with this resolution was that it went a step further. It talked about banning speech and restricting speech and other statements or criticisms that you can make about religion. Um, and that was problematic for us for a number of reasons, but in particular because you know freedom of expression, we believe, is an extremely important human right. Um, and we believe that restrictions on freedom of expression not only restrict human rights in that sense, but also they infringe on individuals' ability to exercise their religion freely. So for a, a number of years, we had been working um, to um, essentially, you know, defeat this resolution at the UN. Uh, and when the Obama administration came in, uh, we took an approach that was um, also working to defeat the resolution, but also to work with the OIC on potentially transforming the resolution into a, a positive. Uh, because we shared some of the underlying concerns about discrimination, um, but we did not agree with the means. Um, and so in 2011, uh, we worked on an alternative to that resolution which passed by consensus in the UN, and it's been called Resolution 1618. Uh, and that resolution essentially focuses on positive uh, actions that governments can take to address religious tolerance. Uh, things like enforcing anti-discrimination laws, uh, education uh, awareness uh, programs, uh, engaging with religious communities, um, all of these kind of proactive positive measures that we practice in the United States are, are listed in this resolution. And we've been working ever since 2011 on promoting implementation of that resolution. And one of the key ways that we've been working on this is with religious communities and religious actors. Um, so as you're undoubtedly aware, this resolution on defamation of religions, it lines up, uh, or, or some governments were using that as a way of justifying or um, providing cover for domestic blasphemy laws. Those laws are often abused or used in ways which um, target religious minorities, uh, which often end up justifying communal violence against, against religious minorities. And so one of the key efforts behind uh, the 1618 effort was to move past that and, and also to get governments to move away from that. Um, and so religious communities and leaders were important both domestically and internationally in our engagement in order to explain to them that we understand your concerns about hate speech that might be directed against your religion, uh, but the way that this type of approach uh, tries to address that goal, in fact, doesn't actually work. Bans on speech often increase the attention that people give to that, uh, that speech. Uh, and often it's used to repress religious minorities. Sometimes you're a co-religionist in different countries. Uh, and so we worked on explaining this position, um, not only with governments and with the OIC directly, but also with the religious communities. And their support was important in order to convince uh, various communities and countries in the alternate approach, the 1618 approach. Um, and their support has also been important in the implementation process. We have initiated a training program since then to work with interested governments on the specific activities that we outlined in the resolution. Um, and we have also had a series of meetings which are focusing on best practices for implementing those goals. And the last meeting of which was held in Doha, it was organized in part by the Doha International Center for uh, Interfaith Dialogue uh, with the um, Qatari Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and, and the focus of that meeting was on collaboration, interfaith collaboration to protect religious freedom. So you had their human rights advocates, you had members of religious communities, religious leaders, and government officials all together working on the same shared issue. And it was uh, very interesting to observe because th th that grouping of individuals uh, don't often get together. Um, and so it was a nice way of using uh, this initiative to convene a lot of the actors who share the same goals and try to direct them in a way that um, you know, they can work together on shared um, policy initiatives. Um, another way that we've used religious engagement is to open new channels of communication. Uh, through our office, um, we often are visiting OIC member countries, and as you may be aware, many of them have been going, have been going and are still undergoing democratic transitions. Um, in Bahrain in particular, um, there have been a lot of sectarian tensions around the transitions that are happening, or the 
the national dialogue and the democracy movement uh, there in that country. Um, and so on one of the visits, we um, used our office in order to try to expand the lines of communication that the United States has with actors in Bahrain. Um, we, uh, you know, our government has often met with the uh, opposition party leadership, the Wafak leadership, but uh, up to a certain point last year, we had never met with the spiritual leader of that group, Ayatollah Isa Qasim. Uh, and we took the opportunity for one of the visits of Special Envoy Hussein to meet with that religious leader in order to explain to him directly U.S. policy in the country and also to explain our concerns that we had about certain groups that were engaging in violence. Um, and so through that activity, you can kind of open a new relationship with a religious leader to explain to them our positions and also to to express concerns that we have, uh, concerns that were also shared by the government of Bahrain, and to do so in order to promote the national dialogue and other collaborative efforts that were happening on the ground. Uh, finally, not to take up too much time, but um, I wanted to mention one other initiative that we have been working with um, religious uh, actors on, uh, and that is um, a initiative that a number of um, religious scholars, uh, in collaboration with the Islamic Society of North America, had uh, developed or worked on, which is issuing a declaration on the rights of and the protection of full, citizen, full citizenship rights for minorities in the Muslim world. Um, you know, in our work in the OIC, I think uh, anyone who's been observing this space can see that there is a, you know, a, a very uh, difficult and um, ongoing problem of violence against religious minorities, particularly in the Middle East and OIC countries. Uh, and that was something that we've talked about a lot in our efforts and our engagements. And this initiative uh, was a way of uh, the religious leaders and the community to try to address that. Um, and so there have been meetings by these scholars, and it's not just the scholars, but also uh, ministers of religious affairs from various countries in the Middle East and North Africa who've attended these meetings, uh, where there have been substantive discussions on a framework for a declaration, including um, or based largely on a well-researched paper on the Islamic basis for protecting religious minorities, which was authored by one of the most influential scholars in, in the Middle East. Um, and so we've been you know, encouraging these actors to continue with this project and are hopeful that it may be concluding by the end of this year or early next year. Um, but this is another example of where we're not directing any actor to do anything, we're not um, you know, funding anyone to do anything, but we are engaging on shared goals and engaging in a way that um, you know, respects uh, these leaders and the authority that they carry uh, and encouraging them in certain ways that also lines up with our goals. Um, so with those examples, I'll turn it back to Alan. Thank you very much, Thank you, Alan, very much for gathering us, and it's a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to say a few words uh, after the distinguished speakers we've already heard, uh, thanks to the Middle East Institute and to Carnegie as well uh, for helping us put it all together. Uh, my sense is that this is both a new and an old venture in the inevitable relationship between religion and diplomacy. I thought that uh, Jerry's approach of seeking three areas, or the department's approach through Jerry of seeking three areas within which to work makes a great deal of sense. Certainly what one would call the broad spectrum of humanitarian work uh, by religions around the globe has always had an appeal, a sense of contributing to the common good, and a feeling of what I would call satisfaction that it transcended theological differences and put into place uh, the values that are widely shared among religions that in themselves contribute to a more harmonious and better globe. I think the notion of dialogue between religious leaders and between religious leaders and thought leaders across the spectrum is extremely important. And another way of emphasizing those portions of religious activity which I think epitomized in the first effort through plans of action can be epitomized in the second uh, effort through plans of coordination and indeed plans of mutual information and plans of dealing 
uh, with problem areas that inevitably have come up in the difference between belief systems. And I think the third area is very important, and perhaps before I finish, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on that conflict resolution. I say this against a backdrop of something I hadn't realized until I actually sat and thought a little bit about it I was, as I was doing an oral history long after I retired from the State Department. But I had a unique uh, position of being an ambassador first to a Muslim country, a largely Muslim country, Jordan, but with an important and significant Christian minority. I then went on to Nigeria, where in effect, uh, two great world religions, Christianity and Islam, had advanced a great deal down the road of conversion and proselytization, done so, in my view, with reasonable harmony at the time I was there, uh, but left a lot in many ways in the hands of traditional African religion, and indeed themselves were heavily influenced by African religious practices. And so while homosexuality is anathema among Nigerian Christians, polygamy is widely winked at. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the edges of Christianity and the edges of Islam are touched heavily by the development of syncretic sex, uh, combining, in effect, traditional religious ideas uh, with those of the mainline religious communities to which they attach themselves in one way or another. And it was an interesting and indeed uh, somewhat eye-opening experience. I then went on to a largely traditionally Roman Catholic country, El Salvador, um, but one that in many ways in the throes of liberation wars and theological conflict among the majority uh, was also undergoing a change in the influence of evangelical Protestantism uh, within the community. Uh, and where the religious leadership was split down the middle and played a, an enormously valuable role in some ways in bringing things together and a divisive role in others uh, by failing to recognize what I would call the transcendental values of the principal system uh, that made things work. I went from there to the world's only Jewish country, Israel. Uh, and from there to the United Nations, which is everything for everybody. And I was delighted to see from Arslan uh, new information from me, me, for me on the work being done in the context of the United Nations, which has to skirt, obviously, the very difficult question that we Americans have to skirt. How do we differentiate between faith-based belief systems, uh, which Protestants largely consider to be individual, um, and the absolute need to develop communication and indeed understanding and cooperation on a world scale. And so what you're undertaking is challenging in many ways. Uh, clearly, it is not the role of diplomats or in my view, the world, role of world leaders to help redefine uh, theological concepts. It is the role, however, of, for all of us to try to bring together those who think and work in the realm of theology around the areas where they can find agreement and help them in their definition of areas of disagreement, hopefully, first, to do no damage, and secondly, seek the seeds of commonality wherever they might exist. Um, I went from there uh, to the world's largest Hindu country. You may say the only one, but Nepal also. Uh, fits that model. And that too was fascinating. I was there only a short period of time, but it was extremely interesting the degree to which, uh, despite the predominance of Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, Jainism, uh, many other uh, religious experiences, including the birthplace of Buddhism, uh, played a role in Indian thinking and Indian ideas. Um, and indeed, India has had its long history of both uh, common working together and terrible devastation as a result of religious differences, not any different from those differences which historically uh, have transcended, put it this way, political harmony in the Western world for thousands of years and which diplomats have to deal with. And then finally, uh, I went to Russia, uh, then and still the largest uh, Eastern 
orthodox Christian country, uh, but one until just uh, a few eye blinks before I arrived was totally committed atheist. And in many ways, uh, these experiences as a diplomat meant that inevitably I had to deal uh, with the patriarch, uh, with the archbishop, with the mullahs. Without doing that, I couldn't understand what was happening, more or less unable to help to try to make a contribution to dispute settlement. Uh, we American diplomats, in some ways, are saddled by invisible handcuffs that over the years have served us well, but always need to be re-examined. One of those, which is a handcuff that we all share, is that we cannot operate outside the Constitution, the law, the regulations, and the policy. And we must serve those interests. Uh, we have the privilege of seeking to change the latter, and indeed the task of doing so when it's inadequate. And we have the right to change the law uh, through our elected representatives. And indeed, even the Constitution with its own processes. The second invisible handcuff is we don't do domestic politics. And in my view, that's extremely important. But I found that the higher up I got in the State Department, the more I had to take it into account. There was no way to convince a president uh, to adopt a foreign policy initiative I was interested in if, in fact, it was completely antithetical uh, to his domestic political success. That's a reality, um, but it is a fancily hard one to deal with, and we must be conscious of that as diplomats. And the third was religion. And here we tended to take the constitutional barrier uh, to establishing state religion as a broader barrier against even involving religion, thinking about religion, or talking about it. And in many ways, of course, it was the basis for harmony in this country uh, that we did not use in whatever ways we could avoid it, religious differences as a source, a source of both political and personal gain. And in many ways that holds true, but it is also true that we have to face up to the reality that we live in a world of a large number of faith-based systems which influence greatly how people operate. So as a diplomat in dispute settlement, I found it was increasingly important first and foremost to understand those particular faith-based systems as much as I could. Secondly, to communicate with the leadership in those systems as to how they saw the kinds of issues that I wished to deal with as a diplomat. Thirdly, to see how the conjunction of views could be used as a basis for harmonizing and moving processes ahead rather than agitating and dividing them. There is no question, of course, that each of the major religions has what I would call its fundamentalist's wing. I saw an old friend, the Prime Minister of Israel, assassinated by a co-religioner on what were clearly religious grounds. We have seen among Christians um, the use of violence in this country to destroy people associated with our government because of apparent religious beliefs. And we have seen as well in Islam, uh, a late manifest manifestation is what we call ISIL, or what uh, my friends in the regions call Daesh, Dalit al Islamiyah fi Iraq Sham. And to some extent, uh, this presents us with special problems, which we do need to understand, but it was never absent from our military engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 10 years. It is in many ways, too, the problem we must continue to work on and try to solve with our friends in Israel and the Arab world, particularly Palestinians. It's extremely important. The Gaza truce is broken down again. We need, as a first order of business, to continue to work on it. 
The last effort with the help of the Egyptians made some progress in the areas of what I would call fundamental change on both sides. We need to find a way to link that particular set of processes to the longer run requirement uh, that we continue to push uh, and do everything we can for the two-state solution. And I admire John Kerry, even in the aftermath of what is an apparent failure to succeed, that he's prepared to take it on. And I don't think he's given up, obviously, the notion that this is still a major challenge for us and we have to work at it. And being able in many ways to solve the problems, which are now a mixture, obviously, of fear. Uh, a fear uh, of annihilation on the part of many. A sense of concern about ethnic and ethnic religious identity and how that will be respected. And a competition over that most fundamental of human goods uh, beyond, put it this way, salvation land and how and in what way uh, people can live together in differences and at the same time enjoy the value uh, that religious promises that harmony will bring to us as we go ahead. Syria and Iraq are the centerpiece of these issues and unfortunately uh, in my view widely informed if I can use that expression <coughs> by um, a heavy emphasis on religious differences, which over a period of time, uh, given goodwill, and one would hope wise, informed, and confident leadership could become the basis for change, and indeed rather uh, than the basis for further radicalization and destruction of human life. And we need to accept the challenge uh, that we as a major player in the world scene have uh, of contributing in whatever way we can to the answers to those problems. Um, I agree with the president that boots on the ground has not turned out to be a very good answer to differences, whether they are religiously inspired, motivated, or informed. And we need to be careful about that. But I think there are ways ahead. We now have a world uh, in among our friends who speak Arabic uh, of turmoil and difficulty. Uh, of change that has come about in large measure through dissatisfaction. Uh, I think mainly with secular approaches, but in some cases with religious approaches. And we need to first understand that question and secondly decide how to deal with it. As a diplomat, <clears throat> we never have perfect options. We are always saddled with dealing with people whose frailties we understand maybe even disdain and would like to change and have very little possibility of doing that. But who we have to inspire, obviously, uh, to greater accomplishments, if I can put it that way, uh, through personal motivation, uh, through long-run interests in their own value system, and indeed through the opportunity to make a contribution to their federal man, which in my view should be the highest good, but often it's the worst danger. So there are plenty of things out there for us to do. A failure to understand how important religion is in these conflicts is the first point of error. Uh, the other point of success is to know and indeed cultivate the relationships that can begin to take common understanding forward to make those changes. And I think that the notion that Senator Kerry had that it is time in an organizational and institutional sense to put the State Department on that path in a serious and open way is very important and very valuable. We need to avoid the traps and pitfalls, obviously, of going too far into theology and perhaps too little into peace. Um, but if we can keep those two points in mind, I know we will have success. And I'm very pleased that uh, Jerry and that Arslan uh, are making their own personal contribution to this effort. I compliment them for taking on these tasks and thank them for doing so. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Pickering. And in some ways, I would like to take off from what you just said to pose some questions both to you and to, uh, to uh, Arslan and to Jerry. 
Um, I mentioned in my remarks that the Middle East is in flames, and in many cases the root issues are religious issues. So the diplomacy is uh, sometimes at the high level that you've talked about, but quite frequently it's how do you get people to stop killing each other over religious issues, whether it's in Iraq or Syria or Bahrain or so on and so forth. So what is the contribution that your work can make to resolving the very issues that Ambassador Pickering uh, talked about, and maybe you two could talk first, and then Ambassador Pickering, maybe you can sort of give your own thoughts. Jerry? Sure, thank you. Um, I guess to get a little more specific on, on strategies to prevent this sort of mass or religiously infused violence, <coughs> we need to um, come up with some you know, case studies. So starting at the bottom-up approach in terms of intercommunal work and understanding, I do think religious literacy is not just needed for our diplomats, but also on the ground where communities don't understand the other very well, and so it's so easy to demonize the other. So just recently I've been working and examining um, the role of scriptural reasoning in this work of increasing tolerance and respect for difference. And it's one way that has been largely tried among the, or between the Abrahamic faiths, to have um, groups study their scriptures together, from the Quran, New Testament, Torah, whatnot, and to have mixed interfaith groups looking at interpretations of passages, even related to violence and tolerance and peace. And what happens in the course of the group study is a dialogue and a relationship building that in fact can be seen to reduce prospects for violence. Let's say, for example, I go into a textual study and I believe as a Christian that you're you know, bound for hell. And I might actually feel that I'm under threat and I must push you there. Some people are, have, have taken their scriptural um, uh, passions to violent ends. In the course of study, you can start to learn with textual reasoning and deeper um, understanding of text that you may still think they're going to hell, but you don't, can't, there might be some interpretation or some wiggle room there about what is the exclusion or the, the need for action. And in that course of just opening up anyone's mind to the possibility that there might be another interpretation of text, not just a literal one of this particular text, we have seen that groups have become more tolerant and started to build relationships. And that can take place in the course of four hours, four days, four months, four years. But in fact, people are looking and scanning the globe for techniques that actually get at religious literacy as well as relationship building at the community level. And scriptural reasoning just happens to be one of them that's being um, used out there. At the community service level, I think that's another um, area people have to look at. I think Ambassador Pickering was right. The humanitarian um, or co the collective action around issues of, of water or safety and other things is another way to get interfaith groups just working together and serving the community. It builds resilience. So there's a new initiative to save the Jordan River, for example, where um, it's understood that all the face value creation but the particular iconic river, Jordan, um, is at risk of dying. You know, it's basically running out of water, filled mostly with sewage, surrounded by minefields, and one could say is a victim of conflict. So interreligious groups will take common cause and say, well, how do we save the river? How do we work on issues of water and environment together? And that's another way of building relationships and fabric on, on issues of common concern. And then additionally, I think we've seen it with Rashad Hussein and as Arslan um, said about his office, when atrocities have broken out in South Sudan, in Kar, and elsewhere in the world, we have dispatched diplomats and tried to pull together religious leaders to go on the site and try to work with local religious leaders. We're seeing it in uh, Nigeria, we're seeing it um, in a lot of cases, but it's been done almost at an ad hoc level. We don't have the capacity to create a mediation team that's literate in religion and religious engagement so that it can be more effective. So the UN could also look at what would a rapid response mediation team look like that in fact is in this category of religious engagement. How does one do that, not just here and there in reaction to crises, but from an ongoing um, 
capacity, whether at the UN, the US government, or among faith-based organizations. So this would require diplomats and religious leaders working more closely together to learn each other's language of conflict resolution, as well as um, scriptural and faith-based reasoning. So those are three examples. Jerry, before we go on, I'd like to understand, we this, the Department of State already has sort of an emergency reaction religious mediation team? No, that's what I'd say. I would like to bring the, the build the capacity. Rashad I Hussein, as a special envoy, has been dispatched with others yeah. to do this work and to good effect. So what's interesting is when we see this working, um, people speaking their own language and being able to engage with, with, with religious leaders successfully, we should be doing more of it and scaling sort of a cadre inside the U.S. government and internationally to be able to do this. Arsene? Yeah, if I might add, just to build on that, um, I think, you know, obviously every situation is different and you have to understand the context of a particular um, conflict. Um, it, in, in many cases, religion is not actually the source of the conflict. It just happens to sometimes overlap with the political lines <coughs> or, or other, you know, economic or whatever factors are driving that conflict. Um, so to say that, you know, a certain situation is religious violence really sometimes, um, you know, it, it kind of mischaracterizes the situation and glosses over a lot of the underlying factors. Um, so that's important to, to recognize because when you intervene or when you engage with actors on the ground who are, um, whether they're a party to the conflict or not, but they're affected by the conflict, uh, the role that they can play um, is important. Uh, so for example, Jerry was talking about dispatching delegations. One example of that recently was in the Central African Republic, um, where you know the State Department's assessment is it's not a religious conflict per se, it's a conflict that's being driven by various political factors and other factors, but there is um, a lot of uh, overlap in terms of religious lines. Um, and so, um, you know, back in April, uh, Rashad had visited um, Bangui, the Central African Republic, and he brought with him uh, religious leaders from the United States, Cardinal McCarrick, uh, Imam Majid, and Leith Anderson, representing, you know, the Catholic community, uh, the Muslim community, and the Protestant community. And they met there uh, on the ground in Bangui with religious leaders who had already been working together to promote peace uh, and to, to end the violence between the communities. Um, the Archbishop of Bangui and the, lead, the, you know, the leader of the Muslim community, the head imam there, were working together and uh, various articles about the impressive work that they had done trying to promote peace and trying to prevent their communities from being sucked into the violence that was going on there. And so the idea of sending this delegation um, was to highlight the efforts that these religious leaders were doing already on the ground and to try to provide them with some uh, solidarity and support from co-religionists or other religions or religious groups, uh, members of religious groups who are interested in helping uh, in that situation. And since that delegation visited, um, some of the members of the delegation have gone back. Uh, some of the groups that they're affiliated with, like Catholic Relief Services, have increased and tailored their assistance in certain ways. Um, there's one group uh, that was, uh, you know, part of the um, delegation, the Network of Traditional and Religious Leaders, that has uh, visited a couple of times, and they're working along with other international partners, including the King Abdullah International Center for Interfaith and Interreligious Dialogue, the OIC, uh, and the Doha International Center for Interfaith Dialogue on promoting uh, intra faith mediation amongst the Muslim community in the Central African Republic, which was divided by some people who were. Um, you know, in favor of working with the Christian communities towards peace and some groups who were essentially writing off those efforts. And so as a result of that delegation, there are mediation efforts at the intra-religious uh, level as well. Uh, so that's just one example of how you can have sort of an uh, external intervention which can bring parties together uh, and uh, you know those parties might have different resources that, th that they can bring to bear on the situation and try to help promote some of the efforts that are already ongoing on the ground. And one other thing I want to mention as well before um, is a lot of the situations um, that we're facing right now uh, where there's conflict with the element of religion involved, uh, it, it's often a case where you have kind of a minority interpretation or a minority group 
that is claiming to speak on behalf of the larger religion. And the majority of those you know, co-religionists or people who follow that religion feel that their religion has been hijacked by this group and has been misinterpreted or, or has been um, you know, um, abused or uh, taken advantage of. Um, and that's just not, not just for Islam, but I think you see that uh, in certain cases in, in Burma and Sri Lanka where you have Buddhist communities who uh, there are certain groups that are promoting violence in certain ways and other um, kind of co-religionists who are, um, you know, not supportive of that. So in those types of situations, I think there's, an, there's another set of tools or factors that, that, that can be employed in order to highlight the voices of the, uh, the mainstream uh, members of, of those communities or the religious leaders who represent most of the members of that religious community whose... Um, you know, religion may be abused in certain ways. Um, and an example of that recently is in Nigeria, where you have Boko Haram um, essentially organized around a particular ideology. I mean, they're essentially a just kind of a mafia group uh, run by this guy who's claiming to act on, on a religious basis, but it's completely not a religious basis. Um, and there are religious leaders throughout Nigeria who at a time were speaking out very openly against Boko Haram, but over the years were targeted for assassination and, and other intimidation by this group. And so their voices were kind of silenced. Um, and so one thing that we tried to do at the State Department after um, the, the, the kidnapping of the schoolgirls was to have kind of a video conference where we, um, through our embassy, um, had a lot of the senior religious leaders in the Muslim community um, you know, via video conference link with some of the religious leadership in the U.S. Um, in order to ask them, you know, what, what kind of assistance can you get? We know that you've been speaking out on this group, but what can you do? And so the State Department convened these individuals, and then they have gone on their own and are now trying to organize an international conference where you have international Islamic leaders assisting some of the Nigerian Islamic leaders on raising their voice to counter groups like Boko Haram. So that's just another example of how in this situation of violence, the government can use its convening authority uh, to bring people together who are, uh, you know, share the same goals, and hopefully we can help, uh, you know, the situation on the ground. Tom? Uh, we've heard a lot of wisdom from the two speakers, and I have little to add. But let me say a couple of things. One is that most conflicts are immediately distinguished by the we-they syndrome. Uh, the we-they syndrome then seeks to develop all of the rationale, all of the logic, all of the illogic as to why the conflict should be perpetuated and that my side should win. And it is in that cycle that historically religion has played a large role or a role as an additional identifier or as a role for rationalizing a point of view in one way or another. It is also clear that the conflicts are often over other questions. That is, that the primary intention of religion X is not to convert everybody in religion Y. It's to resolve some other problem, a conflict over space, a conflict over doing business, a conflict over running a country. Many of these are power-centered in their own way. And therefore, uh, religion in an interesting way can play a remedial role as well as an aggravating role. Particularly the more the leadership vests itself um, in the clothing of religion, the more it should be susceptible to religious interpretation to help resolve the problem. At least one can start with that presumption. But next, there are two or three levels where this can work, and you've heard examples from us of all of them. But one of those is interreligious dialogue using religious leaders and their influence as a major way to affect the movement of the problem toward resolution, whatever that might be. It's been an interesting in the history, or put it this way, the history of non-American Iranian relations. That to some extent, uh, the religious differences have been high 
On the other hand, particularly on the Iranian side, the respect for religious leaders from the other side has been well above their tolerance for the political leaders on the other side, in part because of a feeling that people of religion, maybe people of the book, have enough in common to be able to bridge the differences and they share some common sense of value, some common sense of devotion to a deity that they can see as having a uh, common, put it this way, role and interest in their religious lives. And that's important. The second is obviously how those in the political sphere, the diplomatic sphere, uh, can be informed and make effective use of their understanding as a way to bridge the differences, whether it is with the help of religious people engaged or on their own or basically with counselors from the religious side. And that itself is extremely significant and very important. And the third is because the public always plays a huge role. Much of what is done uh, in, put it this way, agitating and making worse foreign affairs problems is done in the name of domestic politics, unfortunately. Um, we may say democracy is simply splendid, and I agree it is. Um, but democracy, put it this way, informed by people committed to the wrong values, is as hard a problem as autocracy, where the leadership tends to want to say to you, my people won't go for this, I can't sell it. So in both cases, we have a common issue. And if, in fact, the public believes, uh, uh, put it this way, myths, lies, uh, falsehoods about the other side, then you have a huge problem in trying to work with that. And if that has a religious quotient, and it often does, uh, even if it is only a common set of broadly accepted moral values, almost all of which stem from religious tradition, then you can use that as ways to find your way through the situation. I think you've described those all, we've talked about them, but it's an effort to give some structure and context uh, to these things that I say what I said. Questions from the audience? Who would like to be first? Back here. Uh, thank you, I'm Leon Weintraub. Uh, follow me with the Foreign Service right now with the University of Wisconsin. I'd like to follow up on some of the remarks of Mr. Suleiman, who was speaking about Boko Haram, but also expanded to the Islamic State. And I'm wondering if you think it would be uh, appropriate, helpful, and possible if uh, authoritative Islamic leaders who could speak on a global stage would, would issue some kind of statement uh, uh, or, or doctrine that's saying uh, people who, who use the tactics of the, of the Islamic State or Boko Haram are completely off the reservation, don't represent the Islamic faith and should be shunned or declared as heretics or whatever would be appropriate. And if in fact it would be appropriate, helpful and possible, is there a role for the US in that? Arsalan, I think you were fingered, but maybe the others would like to take a question. Uh, back at it, too. No, absolutely. There have been such statements. Um, the OIC itself, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, had a very strong statement um, kind of rejecting what uh, ISIS has claimed to have established and uh, the group in and of itself. Uh, there have been a number of uh, international Islamic scholars who have also issued statements um, directly uh, condemning the group and rejecting their claimed um, uh, establishment of the state. Um, there's an international union of Islamic scholars that has a number of um, uh, senior scholars that are members of it. That organization issued a statement um, and other international personalities have also uh, issued such statements. So I think there is um, or there has been those kind of statements out there, uh, not just on ISIS but also on other groups like against Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and others. Um, we just don't necessarily I guess get reporting on that as much, or you know, the media here may not highlight it as much. Um, but I think those statements are are certainly there, and and that that group, I mean, that position has been expressed by some of these senior leaders. 
Do you have any comment, Jerry or Tom? And just really I quickly. Do you know what Arslan said about the lack of knowledge in this country um, is a, a serious <laughs> issue in many ways. We don't hear much of the good news, particularly from the Islamic side, as to how, put it this way, mainstream leaders in Islam treat the particular problems. And it has been a problem before 9-11, but it was certainly com seriously aggravated. My, my greatest fear at 9-11 was not another attack. It was that we would launch a war against Islam. And President Bush shared that, but we're never quite capable of taking it fully into account, I think. But I've been very concerned about that. And to some extent, um, it's true that the Christian denominations in the United States are unaware, practically, of what's being said. And for the first time, Aslan here has put it out in its various manifestations in a way that is easy to understand. But you wonder why, in effect, we have the ideas that we have. And I think that partly it is ignorance about what else is going on in, in other parts of the world. And we're marvelously served by a highly competitive press whose principal interest is bad news. <laughs> Jerry? No, I think that question uh, begs another one, which others might have commentary on, on the, the role of media in this. So I think media, like religion, can be remedial or aggravating, to use Ambassador Pickering's words. And what is it about it? So again, what is the parallelism of just a communication channel called religion and religious leaders and groups, or media, social or traditional media? And so when we are seeing the viral spread of ignorance or lies or misinformation, um, what does one do about that when you also are balancing the free speech and allowing the internet to be the internet? So these are very serious questions for us because people are starting to fight their battles with rather violent language online. Um, and people tend to use different types of, of media. For example, there was a recent study I was being briefed on related to you know, extremists and exclusivists who tend to be violent prefer YouTube and the graphic nature and the fear factor that can be generated by showing picture, very awful pictures, as you've been seeing, of beheadings and killings and mass shootings that sort of move a certain direction. And then on the other end of the spectrum, pluralists, or those sort of nice people who want us to all live together in, in love and peace, tend to just retweet, use Twitter to retweet positive news stories. So it might be something, you know, in the middle of a concert and a call to prayer with Justin Bieber, you know, he'll, he'll interrupt the conference and you wonder why that goes viral online. But that's, those are retweets and they tend to be like nice pluralists who want us all to get along. And then in between, there's the crowd that you might call more tribal or um, ethno, you know, or, or nationalists who tend to use, you know, Facebook like, and blogs like NGOs. So one has to look at how um, the continuum of religious-based actors and politically motivated actors, power actors, are using media and how is it that we have a strategy on that front to counter viral spread of, um, of violence online. And lastly, I think it just raises the, this question too of what um, the positive nature of religion. How is it that the silent majority, you know, those who are lovers, not fighters, uh, who want to sort of live peaceably and respect the dignity of difference of others, how is it their voice can be encouraged to be amplified? Not as, you know, classing them as moderates. You know, I, I don't think you'd like to be called a moderate friend if you feel that you're actually a, a devoted friend or a devout person. So this language of just inviting people to take a stand for something, your faith, resilience, peace, and the protection of belief and communities and practice, and also a stand against something, which is things that are beyond the pale. And I think it's interesting this week to see a religious leader, you know, the Vatican and um, Pope Francis taking a stand and saying ISIL's behavior is so beyond the pale that in fact it does justify military action. That's a very strong and probably unexpected statement I'm coming out this week. Thank you. Sorry, could you stand up and take your question? Here we go. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. 
And I have an organization by the name of Global Bridges for Humanity. So nice to see you, Tom, and Arsalan, and Jerry. And uh, there is a lot of uh, talk. And right now, in a place called Manassas, there is a mosque that was vandalized a couple of days ago. And I don't know what uh, information has been already uh, printed. Everybody knows about it or not. This mosque particularly is open to all faiths, Christians, uh, Jews, uh, Muslims, and they have dialogue all the time, and they were vandalized this few days ago. And uh, we hope that uh, the public is uh, aware of what's going on. And Jerry, when you said 85% of the people in the world are religious, I don't know what that means. You know, what does religion for me if I'm worshiping a rat, would I be a religious person? Or, uh, you know, if I worship an idol, would I be the religious person? Or if I worship an unseen entity that has created everything, would I be a religious person? And also, there is a uh, big saying that, you know, uh, talk is cheap, put your money where your mouth is. I don't know the budget that you all have, both of you, to come back such a big, big, big uh, mission. And uh, so if the evil is not fed, the evil will die under its own weight. So your task is to find out who's feeding these people, ISAs or the Boko Harams or all the people in the world that they come in and saying certain things and cutting people's head and playing football with it in the name of something. OK. Response? Thank you. Just briefly about who is religious. There was a poll being done around the world. I think Pew Charitable Trust, maybe Templeton and others have looked at this. And it's mostly people who would self-describe as religious. So whether they're worshiping this or that is their, their, uh, their business. And I'd add a point on that front that people who um, of no faith, the quote unquote seculars or atheists are also um, protected. There's a, uh, it's important to keep the conversation that we don't create another we theyism that it, that is being exploited in religious circles to say the secular West. Uh, you know, by polls, the United States is one of the more religious countries in the world, but it can be played <coughs> as if we, you know, we just worship Hollywood and alcohol or other things. It's, it's this, this idea of who is religious is an interesting question, but it's true that the majority of the world expresses itself um, and finds meaning in religion and religious practice and belief. Um, I think that other question about um, money and resources is important and how we are also building up this capacity inside the State Department to deploy expeditionarily people of um, religious literacy and diplomats who would be trained in this more thoroughly. So I think that's a resource question. And also starving off conflict, I do believe that, you know, there's that saying, you are what you, you become what you eat. Um, so a lot of people are feeding conflicts from all around the world um, in, in sort of unbalanced diets. And it's a, it's a challenge for all of us to how to stave off and stem and contain conflict um, and counter some of those resources. Right. Here, and we'll have a lot of questions, so I think we'll take two at a time at this point. Here and here, Tom, and then we'll go back. Uh, Ken Meyer, Gord, World Docs. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd like to uh, make an aside concerning how the media sometimes uh, uh, creates misunderstanding on religion and, and hence hatred. Uh, and it concerns ISIS. Uh, I've seen reported that uh, ISIS offers uh, Christians uh, the choice of conversion or death. I've also seen reported flight that too. <laughs> Excuse me. Flight also. <laughs> Uh, or flight and flight, but I've also seen it reported that they're they're being offered uh, conversion, death, or pay a tax. Uh, big difference, and a uh, uh, tax that goes back to the very first days of of Islam, uh, concerning the people of the book. My question is: We've been getting engaged in a war on terror for a long time now. Uh, do the uh, so-called terrorists oppose us because of our religion? Okay. Um, Michael Lemon, retired Foreign Service, um, wanted to build back up on the diplomacy and religion conundrum, at least two aspects, perhaps three. 
One is if, as uh, several of the pal uh, panelists had noted, that conflicts frequently are struggles for power, influence, resources uh, covered in theological garb or religion. Uh, how does uh, American diplomacy in general take into account that conundrum as they seek to positively engage without being seen as making partisan choices among those contending parties? And that requires, it would seem to me, a great deal of a knowledge that we don't always possess about what is the situational, uh, on the ground uh, lay of the players. The second is in terms of any intervention on ourselves, uh, the challenge of at times validating the narrative of the most extreme. Um, we saw that in Iraq and we've seen it elsewhere. Uh, if you follow site or any of the uh, services that monitor, monitor extremist websites, you will see words or actions on our part that are then used, exploited, to validate the narrative that they are uh, seeking to advance. It can be from the standard sort of crusader Zionist uh, collaboration, or uh, in uh, Iraq, uh, the, it's the West uh, seeking to protect minorities, be they Christian, Zahidi, uh, Yazidi, or, uh, or others, that <coughs> then are exploited by ISIS or whomever. That's the question, Mike. No, well, the question is, how do you avoid this? How do you, how do you deal with them in reality as you seek to come up with specific diplomatic or policy initiatives to take that into account and to mitigate? Okay, three questions. Terrorism, power politics, and amplification of, I guess, uh, of uh, violent leaders. Right. Who would like to take a crack? But I think in terrorism, we've seen a whole litany of things to which terrorists object. And not all of them are religious. Uh, some of those are colonial. Some of those are uh, uh, invasive, that is, sacred space is being taken over or removed from their purview. Some of that is internal, uh, that the monarchies don't do a good job governing us. Uh, so I think it's mixed, and I think that the coloration of religion is certainly part of it, and in some cases it may be the primary appeal in the field to the cr recruitment of new people uh, to serve the, the cause. Um, but each one of these, I think, is quite different, and each one of these deserves separate examination. And that gets to your second question, Mike, that uh, we can put our foot in it if we don't understand how and in what way uh, speaking can be either misinterpreted or misaligned uh, to serve the cause. And we've had that, we had it all through the Cold War with the Soviets. <laughs> so it isn't anything that's entirely new to American diplomats. It requires perhaps a new basis for understanding. It requires a lot of reading, uh, whether it's uh, reading in the new media or reading the old media or a combination of both uh, to do that. And I think that's important. And it requires obviously a lot of language knowledge, all of which uh, certainly we have tried to promote uh, among American diplomats as a way to get the answer. And I think that the other question is, are they getting enough money to do this? And the answer is always no. Mm -hmm. uh, how much more should they get? Uh, it depends upon their su success, but I hope that uh, the budget for the OIC mission and the budget for uh, the Bureau of Stabilization uh, includes uh, a continued effort along these lines, because I think it makes a lot of sense and has a long way to go. Let's take uh, these three right here. Sorry. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jump in. <clears throat> Shirley Buzzard, Heartlands International. Uh, <clears throat> all of that you talked about is, is very impressive, but uh, you haven't mentioned women at all, and all of the colleagues you talk about are women, are men, excuse me. Uh, so I wondered if you would talk about what initiative, if any, you're making to draw women into the whole thing, because they probably are the victims of some of this more than men. Could you pass it, the lady in front of you, right here, in the blue? Okay, um, my name is Harasid Bilso, I'm from Somalia, I'm from Alliance for Peace Building. Could you hold it a little Hello? closer? There we go. Uh, yeah, my name is Harasid Bilso, I'm from Somalia. So uh, I really like it, all the, you see, information is presented by the panel and it's very important. But my question is, you see, it's very important that uh, 
uh, the dialogue between inter-religious leaders, but f what, what I'm wondering is what will be the role for, for the youth? Because in my country, you see, it is the young people, maybe 18, 19, 20, who doesn't have enough knowledge. For example, in Islam, have been told something not true, and how can we afford them that they, don't, they do not harm people based on the difference? Yeah, thank you. One more. This person right here, then we'll get you later. Hi, my name is Janet McGalligot. I served for years as a liaison between the Catholic Cardinal Zubair and the National Islamic Front in the Sudan and was the spokesman for the peace talks and then worked with DDR with the small arms survey there. So my question deals with some of what Ambassador Pickering um, talked about and also uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary White. Currently the envoy to Sudan hasn't been uh, from the US has not been allowed into Sudan because he refuses to meet with the president there and I'm wondering if somebody like you ambassador is it correct to call you ambassador white no just oh okay sorry that's white. Jerry's fine okay <laughs> well it's not bad to get a promotion right <laughs> um, so Jerry it is would it be more valuable to have somebody like you go in because you're dealing with the JEM, the Justice and Equality Movement, which is a non-state actor. And maybe your expertise would be something that would help break things open again. And Ambassador Pickering, you talked about the fact that there have been so many NGOs or other um, influences that are domestic. Because what I saw with the peace talks is that so many of the NGOs that had been dealing with the South Sudan problem and looking at the the north-south things, did it in terms of religion, and they just moved lock, stock, and barrel to Darfur. And that was actually a war over water and resources, and they've taken those same things. And I know how instrumental you have been in that, and how influential you still are. And I'd love to hear how we could help what's going on in Sudan now. Um, and maybe have somebody yeah. like Jerry's group go in, because I don't think I, unless the presidential envoy agrees to meet with the president, then anything will ever happen. Okay. We have, let's take this one, we'll take four. And Thank you very much. I'm Sarah Wolf. I'm a Fulbright Scholar at um, the Transatlantic Transatlantic Academy, and I had two questions. The first one was uh, also for Jerry, because you described this U-turn that happened in the State Department and uh, in the practice of US diplomacy. Do you think that the same is happening on the other side of the Atlantic? And I'm thinking about Europeans, where some countries like France actually have a theology themselves with secularism. So I was wondering if you had any transatlantic um, commonalities on that, uh, especially maybe also with the European external election service if you had any um, contacts. And this leads me to my second question, uh, again uh, drawing from, uh, let's say, maybe European philosophy to engage with Islamist, uh, especially political parties, is that uh, President um, Monsef Mazuki was here in Washington a couple of, uh, or last week, I think, uh, and he denounced actually the fact that Western powers are letting down Tunisia precisely because in is such a big uh, political force and I could also raise the case of Egypt so how is the your bureau, bureau and also maybe um, yeah coping with um, those real politic interests thank you okay. we have a question about the role of women about youth in Somalia about Sudan and its many facets uh, coordination with Europe uh, and Tunisia. Now, large of this, uh, Jerry, falls to you, some of, the, and so I think we'll just go down the line, and I wish you would take this as sort of your, also, your final wrap-up, because we're about five minutes towards the end, and so we'll just go down the line. Jerry, Arsalan, and that's um, because we have so many experienced people in the audience, it's clear that the questions um, are grounded in that experience and, and you know some of the answers behind the questions, I would imagine. Um, we need to do more, better, faster, and it's an urgent time for this issue. So I'd start um, maybe the uh, overall thematic I'm thinking of, which the, our Bureau has tried to exploit, is what does non-traditional or asymmetric diplomacy look like for such a time as this? 
getting beyond some of the traditional diplomacy of, you know, there, there's a, a joke but they were trying to overcome, you know, that the State Department sometimes uses 19th century tools and 20th century approaches and we've got to be facing 21st century problems. So that's a, a criticism we take on board where we try to upgrade all of our tools and our approaches. So non-traditional asymmetric diplomacy or expeditionary, people look even for the phraseology of how to describe doing diplomacy with civil society and others or thematic envoys that aren't necessarily the ambassadors of the United States or Europe who very often find themselves for security reasons behind fortresses and not getting to know the people. The people to people exchanges are withering. So this is a real challenge for our diplomacy in non-permissive environments. You just see that whether it's Syria or Libya, I mean particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, an area that I, I probably know better than others. So in the case of the South Sudan envoy, I do agree with the intention that sometimes um, a top level negotiating envoy is necessary but not sufficient and there are political limitations on, on timing and, and courage and at times you need to you know, send retired ambassadors as well as religious actors or, or, or non-governmental um, entities to help work. And in that case, like a group like Santa Gidio out of Rome has been doing a lot of peace work around the world behind the scenes. Um, they're a good example of actually doing non-traditional diplomacy outside of the .gov or the public space. Um, the role of women as well, it's a real challenge. Of course, in our bureau, I mean, you cannot be dealing with conflict around the world unless you have, a, you know, a gender strategy of inclusion and working with women leaders, like period, end of story. That said, when you get to the religious category, it tends to be, even on the interfaith circuit, a lot of men, patriarchal systems, you know, running um, and getting engaged top down. So there must be another stream that actually uses more empowerment and capacity building for that level of leadership of women faith actors who are going to play a very important role um, on the world stage, but also locally. And youth, of course, same thing. You can't deal with these issues unless you're looking at the youth question. What's incentivizing them? Why is it so, what's the sex appeal of joining and being trained in violence, but also being rewarded for that? So it's like joining a gang, being rewarded, developing new skills, having courage and excitement, belonging, and then showing videos of why this is like heavenly reward when the religious messaging comes on board. And lastly, the question about sort of why do they hate us? You know, the Americans are very often sort of, you know, wondering how we're being perceived. And, and I've heard it described it really isn't about religion, although that is being the religification of politics is taking place, but it's the politics and the policies. These outstanding issues of um, what we're standing for consistently in the world, um, what about the two-state solution, the, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict that continues to, to fester um, as a cancer in the region, among many other things. This is a very challenging uh, space to be working in as we move forward with a consistent foreign policy that's dynamic and not always as traditional as it used to look um, last century. So I'll, I'll close with that saying we're, we're doing our best on the innovative front um, and we need more ideas and partnership with civil society and your thought leadership as well. So <clears throat> thank you so much for this time today. Thank you. Um, I do think the EU has started to take this into account as well, and we've worked with some people in the EAS on their engagement both with the OIC and also with some of the Islamist parties uh, in the Middle East and North Africa region, and um, if you want I can talk to you afterwards and maybe share some contacts um, there. Um, on the question about youth, I mean, that's absolutely critical, and, and Jerry was just getting to this about the recruitment, which goes back to the earlier question about validation and not validating the narrative from one side. Um, you know, a focus on youth is absolutely critical, and a lot of the countering violent extremism programs that the State Department, um, uh, you know, implements uh, focuses on kind of the younger population and focuses on countering the other narrative and avoiding validating the narrative. So part of not validating the narrative is, you know, not to use certain terminology that certain groups might use. Like if someone calls themselves a jihadist, they mean to invoke their religion and saying this is a holy war. So we shouldn't call them a jihadist. We should just call them a terrorist or a violent extremist. Um, and that's one thing that we've, you know, our office has tried to do. Don't use, don't call them jihadists. They're, they're not. They're, they're terrorists. Um, and also in terms of challenging the narrative um, and, and, and getting to youth, uh, obviously a lot of the 
uh, situation where um, these kind of ideologies can really gain hold, you have a lot of uh, problems. I mean, you have kind of a breakdown of state institutions, uh, including educational, uh, economic, um, you know, political, and so a, a lot of those underlying <coughs> structural issues that allows um, violent extremism and those ideologies to take hold have to also be addressed. And education is absolutely one of those one of those issues, including religious education. So it's not just secular education; it's also religious education, and um, that's one thing that we hear when we engage with uh, religious scholars. As well, that they, um, you know, take these issues very um, to heart, and and they feel it's their responsibility to correct a lot of the miseducation that's out there, and um, you know that's certainly one thing that poses a challenge for the State Department because we can't teach religion, you know, we can't fund programs where someone is teaching a certain thing or or anything like that, so it becomes a little bit more tricky in terms of the constitutional invisible handcuff. Um, but that is absolutely uh, an important role that civil society has to play and that the religious leaders themselves uh, are playing and, and have to play. Uh, we just have a minute or two. Tom, you have the final word. Yeah, I know we're in overtime. I'll say just two things. I think as a matter of general rules, and most rules in diplomacy have a few exceptions, this one has a few, but I think the notion uh, that came out of the question of the uh, woman who spoke uh, so much about Sudan, that you demand a price for talking to somebody uh, is one that's close to bankruptcy. That very rarely will people pay up front uh, for the idea to so talk about a solution to their problem with things that solve the problem in your direction, if I could put it that way. <laughs> However, put it this way, uh, outrageous an individual might be in their actions, uh, if they are in fact on the other side and control uh, an outcome, then you have to find a way to talk to them. And you, you may well be right in your suggestion, questioner, that using third channels, indirect channels, unofficial people can always play a useful role. Similarly, track two can. The second piece is also very much along that line. Um, years ago when I was at the United Nations, I urged the Secretary General uh, to keep a list of individuals, former heads of state, former foreign ministers, that he, maybe someday she, can call upon uh, to work in the behalf of the United Nations as unofficial or official representatives. That list need, now needs to have leading religious figures added to it. Similarly, uh, 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 Jerry and Arslan, I'd go back to Secretary Kerry and just say we're thinking about those people like Ted McCarrick, uh, certain Muslim religious leaders in this country, the wonderful Imam from Catholic University, that's certainly not meant to be an oxymoron, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, others who could serve as individuals, who could relay messages, create understanding, build bridges, be part of what we would call the unofficial but now much more employed, put it this way, universe of diplomacy uh, that we could use in, in that particular fashion. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, retirees are fine, uh, but maybe active individuals in their own area who know the problem very well from a religious angle ought to now be part of the official quotient in moving the question ahead. Thank you, thank you very much.